commodities cannot themselves go to market. We must, therefore, have recourse to their guardians. In this chapter, Marx begins by critiquing the theoretical ideas he established in the previous chapter by trying to see behind the fetish that those abstract concepts were hiding, and by doing this, moves his own ideas from the abstract world to the material world. In our previous example, we imagined commodities and imagined their exchange for others. In the real world, however, commodities don't just magically exchange for each other. There's an actual process and social relationship that happens, usually between two people, typically thought of as a buyer and a seller. Marx now analyzes this process of exchange, essentially breaking it down into four conditions. Firstly, that the owners have possession or ownership of their commodities, whatever it is they're exchanging. Secondly, that both owners have a will in their commodities. They are free to act, and this freedom appears as a consenting act of free will. This point is something worth thinking about as we read further on into the book. Thirdly, the alienation of the commodity from its owner. In consenting to give the commodity to somebody else, it becomes alienated from his or her personal ownership. It no longer belongs to them. Lastly, the owners are now in possession and the owner of the new commodity. Juridical expression of this is private property and contracts of exchange, whether this be a written legal contract or just a verbal agreement and acknowledgement. The owner makes up for this lack in the commodity of a sense of the concrete by his own five and more senses. His commodity possesses for himself no immediate use value, otherwise he would not bring it to the market. It has a use value for others, but for himself, its only direct use value is that of being a depository of exchange value and consequently a means of exchange. Therefore, he makes up his mind to part with it for commodities whose value in use is of service to him. All commodities are non-use values for their owners and use values for their non-owners. To return back to the abstract analysis from the first chapter for a moment, an interesting observation is made here. When the owner of a commodity wishes to exchange their commodity for something else, the seller no longer sees it as a use value, only as an exchange value. But there is a contradiction that arises. For the commodity to have an exchange value, it must also have a use value for someone else to recognize its use. However, this use value can only be determined after the exchange. Essentially, what Marx is meaning here is that the exchange is a kind of gamble. You would not know the use value of a commodity until after you've exchanged for it and used it. However, it must also have a use value in the first place for you to want to exchange for it. In this contradiction, the owner of the commodity sees their commodity as the universal equivalent. They base the value of all other commodities against the value of their own commodity. The solution to this contradiction became resolved through a real-world social and historical development of exchange. Only the action of a society can turn a particular commodity into the universal equivalent. Through the agency of the social process, it becomes the specific social function of the commodity which has been set apart to be the universal equivalent. It thus becomes money. Money necessarily crystallizes out of the process of exchange. Marx now begins to examine real-world historical processes of pre-capitalist primitive societies and communities, such as Indian communes and the Inca state, and their relationship towards the processes of exchange. In doing so, he begins to sketch the history of exchange and the development of the universal equivalent, money. Marx argues that these primitive societies produce goods such as food and clothing purely for themselves. They saw products solely as use values to be produced by themselves for themselves. Exchange of goods eventually begins at the border of these societies, where two or more meet, infrequently at first, and the goods would always be products that were never intended for the purpose of exchange. However, over time and repetition, and more frequent interaction between societies and people, goods eventually became to be produced for the purpose of future exchange, commodities. The increasing frequency of these exchanges and the focus on the production of the most often traded and needed commodities between multiple communities, a good example here is cattle, 
gave rise to a universal equivalent. Because if that specific commodity was always needed and could always be exchanged, then it could always be exchanged for something else. So all other commodities and products found their worth in relation to cattle. It's interesting to look at why cattle became a universal equivalent. Firstly, they have many use values. A cow can be eaten, made into leather, milked or even used in farming for preparing the ground. Secondly, they are mobile and easy to transport between the different communities. It's important to remember that the needs and desires of these societies and whatever needed to be traded most constantly fluctuated over time. And so whatever was considered the universal equivalent, money also fluctuated and changed. Eventually, with the discovery of precious metals such as copper, silver, and most notably gold, along with people's needs and desires for them, they too became money. A significant role of precious metals as money was that it could be very evenly divided up, uniform in weight, quantity, and quality. And so the socially necessary labor time that was involved with the extraction and production of precious metals gave the precious metals their value and thus the value that is expressed in all other commodities. While it appears that the use value of commodities has been pushed aside in Marx's argument in this chapter, it is something that is brought back to the forefront again later on, so it's always worth bearing in mind throughout. After all, if labour produces something that does not have a use, how can it have a value? Something can certainly exist without an exchange value though. If I labour in the garden to grow a tomato for myself and I consume it, it doesn't have an exchange value, only a use. Likewise, use values can also exist without being a product of labour. The air we breathe, unworked soil, or the water in the oceans, for example. I'd also like to pose a question for you to think about. How does the class relation between capitalist class and the working class differ in its relationship towards use values? For the capitalist class, those that sell us the commodities we consume, it is more beneficial that products are cheaply made, not as nutritious, quickly break or become unusable to ensure maximum profits during production and exchange processes. For the working class, however, our desire for use values are the opposite. We look for commodities that are more nutritious, built to last, or a good value for our money. Are there any ways you can think about that this class distinction also plays a role in the exchange value of commodities? Exchange is often hidden by its fetish. We usually think of it in terms of a buyer and a seller. What this actually mystifies is that it's always an exchange, that both people are both buyer and both seller. If I trade my apple with someone for a banana, it's an exchange. They are buying an apple and selling a banana. I am buying a banana and selling an apple. If I buy a banana with my money, it is also still an exchange because money is still a commodity. I'm selling my money for a banana. They are selling their banana for money. The riddle of the money fetish is therefore the riddle of the commodity fetish, now become visible and dazzling to our eyes. Marx's sketch of the history and development of exchange and money is very interesting to think about and is a glimpse of an argument that is going to become much, much more developed throughout all three volumes of Capital. It's easy to read it and see the history and development of a thing, a physical object, a commodity, money. But money is just a representation of value and the labour process within it. What is actually happening is that certain social relations between people are developing and being shaped in directions by production and exchange.